question is, who's going to grow your food for us? Or who do we at least expect to grow our food for us? Because right now, if that many people are not um, growing their own food, then you are relying on somebody to come up with some food for you. I mean, that might be McDonald's. That might be Darden Restaurants. might be King Super. Uh, so let's look at this. Um, again, we had 51 answers. Whoa. Nobody picked neighbors, a local CSA, or I will forage in the woods like Nuanda. Uh, if you haven't seen Dead Poets Society, great movie. You should see that movie. But nobody for foraging in the woods. No, uh, no Boy Scouts, no Girl Scouts in this class. All right. Well, how did everybody else answer then? Um, 27 people said farmers on large farms and 24 uh, said farmers on small farms. So, um, you know, we're expecting, um, you know, we're expecting farmers to do it. Uh, about half of us on each, but, but not so much local folks um, as far as that's concerned. All right, let's look at this. Descri Ooh, this is a good one. All right, describe your relationship with food in one word. All right, here we go. This is usually a good list. Love, a love-hate relationship. Uh, happy, uh, easily available. Food is amazing. It tastes so good. My dad is a chef. He's raised me to be open to all types of food. I eat when I need to and as required to survive. I eat as required to survive. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm done with that. Um, fulfilling. Love it. Can't live without it. A lot of it. Love, hate, energy. Good for the most part. My energy fuel makes me happy. It's hard to cook for me. Tumultuous, complicated, decent. It's complicated. Take it for granted. Take it for granted. Uh, love, but very cautious about it. Usually good. Pretty swell. It's the first time I've heard anybody say swell in about 10 years. Awesome. Uh, pretty good for the most part. Essential to life. I have struggled uh, with disordered eating, but it's better now. Good. Sometimes I love it. Sometimes I hate it. Negative. I love food. Lazy and convenience based. Lazy, necessity, grateful, nothing really special. Fastest of fast food. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. The recording was accidentally paused. Sorry about that. I picked up on that. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, a positional good would be some type of good that people like feel that it's positioned opposite or in contradiction to another one. So a positional good, we think of organic food as being kind of expensive up there. Only a certain number of people could afford it. It might not be as accessible for large communities, certainly for many communities where there are food deserts or it's only grocery stores or not, excuse me, not grocery stores, but gas stations, places like that. You're not going to be able to have access to that food. So something that we feel says something about us. A positional good could also be like the newest iPhone or a really expensive car, something that shows sort of an outward display of our wealth. But here are the words that came up. Expensive, healthy, fresh, natural. And the first word, uh, expensive, six people, healthy, six people. So kind of tied between those. Clean, safe, safer vegetables, vegetable green, gross, marketing, no pesticides. I know that's two words, non-toxic, local, whole foods, uncontaminated, better, pesticide-free, fruit, non-GMO, cleaner, no pesticides, all natural, healthy, chemical-free, good, pesticide-free. Um, just sort of a rundown of, um, of our perception of, of what that is. And, and yeah, uh, some of that is true. Certainly there's a certain types of pesticides and, and uh, bug control, things like that, that are allowed. They have to pass inspection um, when we're talking about that. Anyway. All right, Green Revolution. I'm not trying to go too fast, but I do have to wrap this chapter up today. So great test question. What does the Green Revolution refer to? A series of strategies developed during the mid to late 20th century to combat starvation by expanding the production of staple crops through crop breeding. So, you know, GMO, the evolution of GMOs and saying instead of producing a very diverse sort of food basket um, like we were looking at before with Iowa, we're now just going to produce staple crops. You need calories. And this is when we started looking at um, a calorie revolution. And that was what, and, and of course, at all times, and this is good because science finds out new information. So, okay, margarine's healthier. No, 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 backtrack on that. The way that that combines with fat molecules, not healthier. Wait, it's all about calories. No, no, it's not all about calories. Well, by expanding the production of staple foods, you've really just expanded that. You haven't, you haven't looked at nutrition, right? So they, they do that. 
and 20, 30 years pass. And then we realize that we're, we're really suffering from malnutrition and micronutrient malnutrition, right? And that has to do also with the size of our food system. So besides wheat, besides, you know, flour for bread and those types of things, um, it was a success maybe as far as calories are concerned, but not a success as far as health is concerned. The green revolution, as we look at it, links micronutrient malnutrition, okay? So another good term to know, a diet lacking in sufficient quantities of micro, micronutrients. And that's not just in other countries, that's in this country as well. Um, more than 2 billion people are suffering, almost two thirds of the child deaths are attributed to nutritional deficiencies. Have enough calories, don't have enough nutrients to survive and to thrive as a human being. And again, we connect this piece to we're missing a diversity of crops, right? We know that that's suffered. Um, and because we aren't growing as much food, um, you know, we have radically altered dietary patterns for people. And, and now think about this. Really, our dietary patterns were set for generations and generations and generations and generations. It has only been recently that we would have as much meat as available to us as possible. It would only be recently where we would have unbleached flour, right? White flour or, or, or bleached things where we've taken some micronutrients out. And, and, you know, at first we think that science is really advancing. So that though, where you can now get like a kumquat from the other side of the earth ordered to your door in 24 hours, this again is a very attenuated window. It's a very small space and time but if we look at what it's done, it has dramatically altered our dietary patterns, which is why people are struggling so much and in so many ways, especially with the food that is heavy in um, chemicals, heavy in, in, in producing it in a way in a lab that, that isn't as natural, that has a lot of sugars, a lot of highly processed carbs, um, corn, actually, rearranged corn in most versions of those foods that don't require certainly that type of sugar or that type of corn. So they've gone from really diverse polycultures to monoculture producing a single plant species over a wide area. That's another great term for the test that should be on there um, for a number of years. Now, what happens when you do that? Uh, well, you deplete the soil, right? You take out the micronutrients and the biodiversity from the soil and, and then you get less of a yield and less of a yield and less of a yield. It doesn't matter how much chemicals you put on it. It doesn't matter how much you water it. Um, monocultures tend to destroy and uh, the soil that it's in and you need to rotate those right you need polycultures simply adding more pesticides um, using a bigger vehicle that that sort of technology fix isn't working okay now we've looked at sorry need to take a drink we've looked at treadmills of production of other things too but this is treadmills of agriculture right so you just think of it as a regular treadmill. Once you get on it, you got to keep going or you're going to fall on your face, right? I mean, that's the metaphor here. Like if, if, you've, ever, if you've ever seen any footage on, uh, on the internet of somebody like running, 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 or stopping for a second and getting dropped, whatever that might be, um, it's the same thing. So the, you know, you've got a larger and larger size operations, and then you're pressured because it's like, here's new technology. You can increase the size of your operations, and you know if you increase the size of your operations, you're gonna be increasing your profit. But only initially, right? Because once you jump on that treadmill, and once other farmers jump on that treadmill, then it's no longer new, then everybody's got that, okay? Then the market becomes flooded, right? The profits are gonna go down, and farmers are left in debt. I mean, I'm not sure if we have anybody from a farm family in here, but a combine, a tractor, you know, these things can be upwards of a hundred to five hundred thousand dollars for a piece of equipment. And although you're going to get the loan for that, um, farmers are finding themselves left in debt. And what we've seen, particularly the last couple of years, is this administration I think has been really really not communicating with farmers. We've seen a, a huge uptick in suicides in rural America on farmers. Uh, Iowa you name it. So it's a big deal when people are left in debt, right? The remaining farmers, then if you didn't jump on that, right, you've got to adopt some new technology to try and remain competitive. Or at least, at least this has been the model for farming. Bigger operation, 
bigger machine. And of course, more people get it. Now everybody's producing that way. And the next piece and the next one. So again, we also have a pesticide treadmill, right? Um, which means you're going to apply this pesticide at first and it's going to take care of business. But guess what? Evolution. That's right. Evolution. So bugs and pests um, are going to get resistant. They're going to find ways to evolve around that. So then next thing or more of that pesticide or a more intense version or something we haven't tested before, whatever that is, higher concentrations, more applications, new chemicals. Okay. And this is a problem when our knowledge of farming is replaced with the knowledge of chemical application. Um, I have known many, many, many old school farmers and those individuals are some of the smartest and most capable people, the smartest and most capable people I have ever run into. Um, because you need to know how to do, you need to be a master at so many things to be a farmer. However, it does not take a lot um, in ways when you replace it with chemical application. And of course, the quality of food that you get is drastically different um, and, and what's on that food. So when eating conventional food growth, use pesticides, makes you feel, what makes you feel safe to do so? The amount of pesticides, the specific type of pesticide, I don't know, I just trust the food. I don't, but I eat it anyway, right? So you could go to whatsonmyfood.org. It's a really fantastic site. We're not gonna go there now, but it's got like the chemical components and breakups. What are the exact chemical molecular models of this pesticide? And, and what are the repercussions of that? I think it's a really interesting thing. If you're a foodie, if you're really into food, um, check out that website. It's, it's worth the time, I think. You've heard about the clean, uh, the clean dirty dozen and the clean 15. <laughs> I don't know. You've got to make it fun somehow, right? So the worst celery, peaches, strawberries, apples, blueberries, these are things that are the most heavily pesticided. I mean, apple production, big time. Now, if you look at the others, onions, uh, sweet corn, and most of that isn't grown for, is sweet corn grown maybe specifically for folks, field corn, much different. Pineapples, mangoes, asparagus, kiwi, cabbage, egg, oh my, remind me to bring up coconut monkey slave labor. I know you didn't expect to hear that today. <laughs> I just I just saw like 10 people's faces up, huh? Um, watermelon, grapefruit, sweet potato, honeydew melon, um, you know, things that are grown underground, things that just don't really require the amount of foliar feeding and pesticide application that they use, uh, or these big orchards where they're spraying it on there. And of course, that is dangerous for the people, largely immigrants, largely, right, um, migrant workers, immigrants, folks that are not in dominant culture that are going to take those jobs. So we see the, the rates, and I think I might have that in the next few slides, but of cancers for those jobs. Um, you know, through the roof as comparative uh, to other folks. So those are uh, also very dangerous jobs. I'm going to stop the share here for a second. Okay, I'm seeing all your faces. Jason, did you just say coconut monkey slave labor? I did. <laughs> um, I, I don't have the package with me, but I was, this is two or three weeks ago. My partner, she works at Vitamin Cottage. And so I'm drinking, I think it was coconut water coconut milk or coconut water. I think I was drinking coconut water. And I look at the bottom and it said, this water has been made without forced monkey labor or something like that. I, I, I love the look on all your faces. Now you need to go out to the store, I guess. I'm going to find that. I'm going to have Julie find that. Or I'll find it and I'll read it to you. But I was, I was not under the impression that people were unfairly working monkeys to go up to trees and gather the coconuts so that people wouldn't have to and that the working conditions for these monkeys would be such that when they replaced monkey labor that they would actually put it on their label. I have no idea if this is an organic food store type thing or if somebody stepped in to save the unfair laboring of monkeys. Either way, I find it sociologically very interesting. All right, I, I digress. <laughs> you, know, you know I digress. Um, let me get back to this. Okay. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> let me get back to the screen share. Oh, that's too much. Okay. Um, there we go again. Okay. Um, so I said before, and I kind of left off with the tech fix isn't working and it's not right. Or it's not working as we would like it to. So back to the base. We have basically, what did we say during the last chapter on transportation? It's back to the basics. 
it's back to trolley cars, it's back to daylighting and walking and bikes and multimodal transportation. The same thing um, is here and is as far as we can think about food production. So I'm opening this up really quick and oh, there's a great, sorry about that. Uh, that's a really great, um, I, I didn't think it was quite what, I, sorry, I didn't think that was quite what it was. That's a great thing with uh, Joel, who I mentioned before, oops, from Polyface Farms. Let me get out of there once really quick. Sorry about that. And all right. Okay. Um, so polycultures, like I said before, uh, raising grain, fruits, vegetables, livestock. Um, if we look at a polyculture versus a monoculture, small organic operations, look, they're, they're kicking the butts of these large operations. These small farms and farmers are making plenty of money. They're doing it right. They're working with biodiversity. Raise your hand, and we're not gonna have time to watch this semester, but would you raise your hand or a little nod if you've seen The Biggest Little Farm? It's a fantastic documentary. If you have not seen it, I am absolutely in love with it. And not just because I own a farm, it's one of the most inspiring documentaries I've ever seen. The Biggest Little Farm. Find it on Amazon watch it. Just, I have goosebumps talking about it. It's the coolest thing. First thing we did after watching that was um, to uh, say that we were going to build some owl homes. Uh, there's so many just great ideas in that. Anyway, polyculture, a variety. And 300 studies examined, right, organic food not only has the potential to feed the world, it can. It can produce more. It can replenish the soil conditions. It's more in line with natural processes. It costs much less over time. You have to consider this too. If you're, if you're buying billions of gallons or spraying, excuse me, billions of gallons uh, of pesticides, you've got to buy that right? You have to buy it. That costs money. If you're looking for seeds all the time that aren't organic, that you can't just propagate yourself, that costs money. So local sales are getting stronger and stronger and stronger with people. Although people in this class identified that they're not getting most of their food from CSAs, certainly they're more available. And let's back it up for a second. And let's talk about new nourishment, right? Nutrients. Um, an egg is one of the things that has the most protein, is the most nutrition of any kind of food that you can imagine. If you have that egg within 24 hours, the nutritional value of it is so different than if you wash it. It's so different than a week later. And most of the eggs that you're getting uh, are coming from, sorry, the name of that documentary was The Biggest Little Farm. But most of the eggs that you're getting in the store are three to four weeks old. They have been shipped. They have been refrigerated, and at that point, they contain very little nutritional value. So it's not just are you getting something from somebody local, it's the time it takes for it to get to you. And the nutrient value of any food breaks down with time. Um, so it, it's fairly logical in that. If, if you want to eat foods with higher nutritional value, eat foods that are more ready to you, that are closer to you, that are more available to you from farm to table. Strong ties to the community. We already looked at that last time, right, with uh, Arvada and Danuba, the smaller ag town and the larger ag town. So you've got stronger ties, better mental health, better mental wellness, better utilization of your resources, and that might be light and water and electricity and nutrients. But so many of these smaller polyculture farms are, are absolutely doing amazing. Now, this might be the link, and I'm not sure, to a really cool thing that was, I'm not sure if it was it's within the last 20 years, but it's somebody that lives in LA that has less than an acre right by the highway. If you've ever tried to drive in LA, we talked about that before, and they're growing thousands of pounds of food on their property every year. It is super inspiring. If you get a chance, we don't have time today, click on that link and watch it and watch just what people are able to do. It's not even an acre or a half acre. It's so much smaller than that. Just what people can do when they start using polyculture organic methods that's just not chemical application in regards to farming. It's, it's brilliant and exciting um, and that's just not because I have a farm, um, right? That's because to me finding ways to grow food and continuously do it better and better and healthier, healthier and more and more of it or whatever that might be while using 
polycultures and biodiversity practices and you name it, like Joel Salatin, like I said, the pigs go to one area, they root up stuff with their noses, then the chickens come in and they poop and they kick it all over, then the cows come in and they graze and while they're not grazing, you're using the cow poop from another field to have to grow the grass. I mean, biodiversity works together. When things are working together, it's awesome, particularly when you're not just driving that with like chemical application. Um, if the organic small farms are better financially, why are there so many factory farms? Is the factory farm goes to declining? Um, production of food on those giant farms is declining. Yeah, their yields are declining pretty substantively. Um, but it's the, it's the pattern. Look at how many, I would say just look at how many people we have to be fed. Um, and so right now, if most of us are getting our food from the grocery store, then these giant farms are going to be a lot of the farms that are producing. That being said, a lot of those factory farms are putting out meat and wheat and GMO corn. It is a lot of the smaller organic operations. And by smaller, I mean organic valley is not small, but they work with hundreds of small organic farms or dairies, right? So the operations are much smaller and can still meet the needs of, of a lot of folks. So yeah, um, definitely financially well off. Uh, and, and that is coinciding with this demand, the localized demand, people knowing that they wanna be more closely connected to their food. At that point, I think it's awesome because it's become a food movement. And we're no longer just talking about like uh, some of the answers on our list. I eat to survive, I get that. When I was in college, I was eating Martha Gooch, uh, you know, like generic mac and cheese and, and ramen. But people are now in college, 20 years ago, people in college now are like, are like getting closer and more connected to their food and their food systems. And a lot of my students work at CSAs and they work on farms and they like grow their own food. So to me, um, I see the potential for that being really awesome. Do you expect people to grow food for you? Do you have a plan in place? How much food can you really grow in a yard? Okay, here's that link. There we go right there. Um, this table full of food is just uh, a, several years ago at our old house uh, before a frost or a freeze. Um, if you bring in tomatoes before they freeze and you put them in a box in one layer or a bag in one layer and put them in the basement or someplace dark, they'll turn red or yellow or orange or whatever colors they're going to be within about a week or two. Um, and they won't lose too much firmness. So as long as they're cool. So actually, you know, if it's the end of the season and you're worried because all you have is green tomatoes, um, that's not a loss. You just have to, you know, use those in the right way. Ah, <laughs> what is that? Um, I don't know. I want to say it's cute, but I think it's just disturbing again. Do you have a right as a consumer to know the ingredients in your food? I believe I asked that question. I, I, I really do. So let me look at that. Um, let me pop back here. Top hat. Uh, what is the, let's, Back here. Oh, hold on. Do you have a plan to feed yourself? Yes, nine people, 28 no, 14 people, damn. Um, and then I didn't ask that next question. Sorry about that. Um, but it gives us at least uh, an idea that knowing or having the right to know the details of our food production is not necessarily a given. Knowing the right about the ingredients in your food is not necessarily given. Colorado tried, not the last time, but two times before that, and to get GMO labeling, just like California on the ballot. It's supported by 82 to 90% with one week to go in both states, and then misinformation campaigns about how the price of your food is going to go up if people take the same label and simply like Put an asterisk by the genetically modified foods. It's a lie. Every single time it takes that support from 80 or 90 percent down to 49 percent or 48 percent. So we have not gotten that, but most of the people in here in this class agree. Um, you know, do you as a consumer have the right to know? Uh, and this was just today, the ingredients 31 to 2, yes. Do you as a consumer have the right to know the details of your food production? 31 to 2 again overwhelmingly so, and yet we are overwhelmingly at a lack of transparency and information about the ingredients in our food um, and have people that spend millions of dollars so that you don't label food a certain way, um, which uh, again speaks to that sort of nature of transparency that we've talking about all semester long. All right, let me 
screen share here and see if I can get to that real quick. There we go. All right. Um, do you support labeling of GMO ingredients? No rise in cost to your food. Why, why not? Here's the right to know some information about GMOs wanting to be labeled. The support is very, very high. And I'm not going to get too much into it here. This talks about GMOs in the process, but there's a huge difference between cross pollination and breeding and then genetically modified organisms. Okay. Um, I have uploaded uh, this um, PowerPoint. So if I'm going through these kind of fast, just uh, rest assured that you can always click back into the class and, and get those. All right, on, under modules. High risk crops, we know this, tomatoes, but recently, and I think the interesting thing here is that um, in 2012, pigs, um, they were trying to get a patent for pigs. They've, they've tried to get a patent and have successfully for salmon, genetically modified salmon, and then they wanna release those into the wild. We have no idea what that will do to um, populations of fish that have been unaltered. And now I just at least want us to think of not just it's so bad, but if we know that you're genetically modifying and copywriting the genetic code of a corn plant and you drive that truck past a farm and that farm gets some of the pollen and those plants on a farmer who's not doing those crops get cross pollinated, they sue the farmers, they stop them from seed saving and they make them destroy their crops. So we now have genetic like a patented life in the form of a plant, but I want us to at least consider how different it is when you patent life, an actual living, breathing animal. So that is a much different thing. And if they are going to take away people's farms and crops and rights based on what they will do with cross-pollination, the same thing will happen and has happened when we get into cross-breeding of these animals and genetic material and who owns the patent on, I guess, life itself from any of these creatures. All right, um, I don't know that it has to be conventional versus organic, but boy, doesn't it seem like it? You know, we are very emotionally charged about organics, maybe not so as much about conventional. Um, but what is an organic system? Great test question, great definition here, I think. An ecological production management system that promotes and enhances biodiversity, biological cycles, and soy biological, soil biological activity. It's based on a minimal use of off-farm inputs and on management practices that restore, maintain, and enhance ecological harmony. All right. Remember this, please. Not just because it's going to be on a test, but this is a beautiful thing. <laughs> the people who wrote this, who are trying to get across the idea of organic farming and organic biological systems, this is a very thoughtful definition. I think it means a lot. So, we promote biodiversity. Yes, again, that name of that um, documentary was The Biggest Little Farm. And, and it's what that documentary is all about. Like, you can't just kill the coyotes or remove the wolves from your biodiversity or that chain. Look at what happened in Yellowstone, right? And again, on this election cycle in Colorado, we were voting to restore wolf populations. That, I mean, we're voting for biodiversity management systems um, whether you know it or not. So it's a big deal. So enhance your biodiversity, pay attention and enhance your biological cycles, keep the soil and enhance the soil. So this doesn't even speak to like, I'm just going to farm and try and do it the right way, the bare minimum. This is, I want to do it the right way and enhance it and make it better than it was before. I want the soil to be better than it was before to grow my food into so that biodiversity in it thrives and therefore we can sustain ourselves better. On management land practices, minimal off practice, that makes sense, restore, maintain, and enhance ecological harmony. Um, I find this to be a really important thought for us as we look at what kind of concerns we have and what it is to grow in an agricultural um, way organically. So here's some questions that we look at in regards to organics. Are we following biological cycles? Are we working with biodiversity? What are the impacts of our farming on our soil, air, water, and our community? Um, I mean, I know because I go on that fishing trip with my dad every summer, uh, and, and I can see up over the bank of the river these giant machines, and when they go to spray the stuff, we're out of there, but that is right by the water, 
it leaches in those places, it rains a lot in those places in the Midwest, that leaches into the water that goes right through your neighbor's land, right? And consistently my dogs go down to our irrigation canal and they're drinking out of the water. So it's a big deal. Um, I think here, what are the impacts on the community? And other farming operations might not, uh, and definitely don't consider that necessarily, but I think it's really important. How am I, what am I using to fertilize with? Yes. Um, this year I got into uh, aerobic or aerated compost teas, um, which I think are really fantastic. If anybody has any question on that, you're basically building your own tea instead of buying something out of a bottle to feed a plant with at different times of its growth cycle. Uh, we had a lot of success with that this year. How are you using your water? We've talked about that. I love this. How can I restore ecological systems? We went through a few years ago and we were uh, walking through some of the irrigation canal in the winter. We found some seeds. We planted them. They were the cattails, right? And those plants have edible value. They have birds that make homes in them. They suck up and can filter the water from our pond and take toxins out of the pond. So not just living in a place, but what can you do to make areas better? I think that's kind of an awesome thing to consider. Um, next, super important, right? How can we teach this next generation for food security or about food security or connect them? Um, when the boys were very little and they were first at Olander Elementary School, Julie and I said, we'd like to have an organic garden at the school. They said, talk to other parents. We talked to other parents. We put a proposal together. They got the money for the district and they built an organic garden. It's awesome. Every class from then on for the last 10 years has been taking their food scraps from lunch out and composting. Each class, each grade gets to plant certain things. Do I think it changes their life forever? I don't know, maybe, um, but for sure it connects them to their food more, which is what we're talking about here. If you care about bio, bio, um, excuse me, biodiversity, then, and you care about your food and you care about those types of things, then you'll, you'll be caref more careful with what you do, more thoughtful, and that will impact you and others around you. Where am I growing, right? I mean, that's a big deal. There are two organic farms here in Laporte that are going to be right next door to this giant gravel pit if they actually put it in. Now, because of course, they did some dirty deals and behind the scenes thing, this is a gravel pit that would be put out here in Laporte. So usually in rural areas, um, they got approval for it, but because they did go about it in illegal ways, that approval has been stopped and stopped single-handedly by all of the residents of Laporte who contributed to a legal fund, hired a lawyer, and have been on top of this now for the last two years. But those farms and those people that run those farms would absolutely have to sell their farms and stop farming if a small batch cement plant sets up right next door to them. So you also have to pay attention, um, you know, where are you growing when we're looking at this? All right, now we hear a lot uh, of negativity about Cuba, um, but we need to get off of that train because what they are doing with urban agriculture is probably the greatest thing that I've ever seen and that this world has seen in as far as urban agriculture that's organic. So of course, really quickly, the United States puts embargoes up, you can't get uh, oil and you can't get gas. So almost immediately, the first problem in Cuba was, Cuba, was how do we farm when all of our tractors are useless? And what they decided to do was small urban farmsteads using only organic methods and whether that's an ox pulling it, whether that's you know, crop rotation, you name it. And here are two links to some of the coolest videos that talk exactly about how they revolutionized their health, revolutionized their connectivity to food, and did so immediately under a lot of stressful conditions. I think that this, uh, those, those videos are really, really awesome. Now, urban gardening and urban guerrilla gardening. Well, you just called it guerrilla gardening. Anytime somebody says something like that, I'm into it. What? You mean that I can, I can go plant seeds where I'm not supposed to and let, you know, wildflowers and, and natural plants come up? You mean that I can garden in a corner in LA? You bet. And why not? You know, we need to get people in cities more connected to their food to begin with, which is really, really important. Um, but 70% of the world's population lives in an urban area and will uh, in another 30 years, right? So why not grow in cities? Why not make cities more habitable for people and connect them even there um, to food more? Because, you know, we're going to have to grow differently. 
big fields out in the middle of nowhere, that's not necessarily going to cut it. We need operations of food growing everywhere. And a lot of that is indoors. Um, if you're interested in this, check out this movement in Britain where they're growing food in old bomb shelters. They're growing like a ton of indoor grow operations, hydroponics, and all sorts of really amazing things in these old bomb shelters from World War, uh, World War II. Anyway, um, people are taking food production indoors more increasingly and in urban areas. It creates a ton of food security, right? By increasing our intimacy with food, location, sociologists are all about integrating it. And now you've got all sorts of people in the city getting into like being chefs or getting connected to growing their own greens and people that are coming from neighborhoods where they don't need like a hundred thousand dollar bill at the end of college. They need like a trade like chef school or farmer or something like that. So awesome dietary connections, certainly a greater dietary diversity when you're growing anywhere on site. And the last time I was in Chicago, the rooftop gardens that I was checking out a couple of years ago from my buddy, my buddy has a, you know, really nice apartment way up in, you know, the top part of a building. So I was looking down over it. There are a lot of food. There is a lot of food, excuse me, being grown in Chicago and a lot of gardens, rooftop greens, trees, you name it, that people are utilizing now. And in fact, in some areas, and I'm not sure if this is a country or here in the United States, I can't remember right now, but they are mandated that every single new place that goes up has to have some type of mitigation for carbon by having plants and trees in a garden on the roof um, to begin with. So something that I see is, is a, a really, really taking off already, but going to be soon um, a lot more. Urban farming groups have won court cases, so that's good. And really, it's just a giant mental shift from looking at a curb on a corner in a city and saying it's dead to seeing like some type of potential there for life and enhancement of that. All right. Okay. Stop the share here. Just finished with this chapter. Let me check that chat thing. My dad is a roofer in Chicago in the past years. So he's done more green roofs than ever before. Absolutely. Um, it just gets back to architecture and how lousy it is and how few changes we've made over the last 50, 60, 70, 100 years. Like, you should be doing that. You should be using passive solar. I mean, we're not even doing really the most basic of things, but having a system where you can live that is not only uses the water and collects rainwater and uses passive solar and you can grow food in there. I mean, that's, that's a safe place um, in an uncertain future uh, to be sure you know, and not an apocalyptic type of thing. I'm not kind of going there or anything like that, but just in an unsure future. All right. <clears throat> we have finished the chapter on food. I think we're good there um, for the day. I'm going to be looking at climate denial and that final wrap up chapter next time. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking a little politics uh, in that wrap up chapter and we can. Look, if we're going to look at um, I don't know why politics has to be like, you know, especially during election year off limits. Anyway, you can look at whether somebody and what they've done for the environment or what they haven't done by looking at voting records. It's really easy. And then it's not so hard to say, yeah, here's the data we've collected from Republicans. Here's the data we've collected from Democrats. Here's the data we've collected from independents. This is how people have voted. And, and that tells a lot without being political whatsoever, just looking at data. So we're certainly going to do that. We're going to talk a bit about the impact that our political institutions and how we can influence them have on climate. Um, I know that this next administration that's getting ready to come in in January has a robust climate plan, the likes of which we didn't even see during the, um, the Obama administration. So I'm hoping for a lot more participation from this country being a, a leader using so many, um, consuming so many, you know, so much raw materials and having such a big impact on this world. So that's going to be definitely um, something to look forward to exciting from that perspective. Now, that doesn't mean that we can let our guards up. And certainly, if you've heard anything about COVID and the environment over the last year, it's like, oh, well, we had so many emissions and they were down and now the world's going to heal itself. Wrong. Wrong. That's not happening. That's a, bl a blip on the radar like that. And you can't uh, muck things up for 100 years or more and then just uh, hunker down for a month in your basement with Netflix and suddenly come out and everything's great again. So it does relieve a little bit of stress in the meantime, but um, some big steps need to be made in the next uh, short, very short while. So, all right, you know how things are going. You know which direction we're headed. There's the Star Wars tree again. Um, any questions, anybody, uh, about anything? 
before I call it for a day and call it for this week. Yes, I will have a study guide out um, this weekend. So look for that. Um, and we know that the papers are gonna be released. If they're not released today, they'll all be released by tomorrow. So we should be good. Any questions? I'm gonna take a sip of water. Whew, I've been going for a while without taking a drink. If we need to make up an exam, that is on the 7th, correct? Yep, it should open up sometime on the 7th, Monday during the day, early, okay. probably in the morning, but it's open for like 24 hours. So assuming that you missed exams one, two, or three, you can log on um, and we'll, I think, release the passwords and, you know, in the description of each one of those, it'll be there. Yep. Great. Yep. Anybody else? Don't miss out. And here's the deal. For most things this semester, I have been full Jedi, right? you're being full Jedi. Like, I got a mechanism so that you can still take this test. I got a mechanism so that you can still donate. It's late, Jason, uh, COVID, the world, my, my girlfriend broke up with me. Whatever that is, we've had a mechanism. There are no more mechanisms, <laughs> okay? This, this is it, we're in crunch time here. If you miss the makeup day, nobody's opening it up for you again. I have 600 students, that's just, there's too much stuff to do, last call. Now. Exam number four, it's going to be open for like three days. If you missed that, last call, right? So we are on now what I would call, what we usually call the end of the semester. But, uh, and I'm fine because I know it's weird. And I've had, I've, had, I've had potentially one of the worst semesters personally in my life yet have had a fantastic semester in this class. So I know things are hard. Reach out to us if you need to. You know we're a compassionate group of people um, and that we want you to succeed. All right. Anybody else? Anything? Anything? <laughs> I don't have too many moves this afternoon. All right. Be good people and do good things. Thanks for being here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, take care of yourselves. Be safe. Thank you for still participating and showing your faces and learning. We're almost there. All right, everybody. Peace. Take care. Peace, everybody.